Hello and welcome back to the Clinical Update podcast. I'm Pat Anderson, editor of MIMS Learning, and I have with me here two of my fellow editors, Dawn Powell and Sangeeta Krishnan. We're responsible for a large bank of learning content on MIMS Learning, which helps clinicians to keep up to date and meet their requirements for annual appraisal. And in this podcast, we aim to bring you just a few of the learning insights from these experienced clinicians to inform your practice as a healthcare professional. In this episode, first of all, Dawn's going to talk about some key messages from a learning module on depression and chronic pain. After that, we'll feature an interview between Sangeeta and our gastroenterology clinical advisor, Dr. Juliet Lowry. Finally, we'll feature a learning nugget on a refractory condition and the latest in the battle to try and find effective treatment. So I'll hand over to Dawn now to hear about our featured learning module from MIMS Learning. So for this episode, I want to discuss a module that looks at depression in people with chronic pain, written by the MIMS Learning Pain Management Expert Clinical Contributor, Dr. Mick Sapel. The module looks at how these conditions can affect each other. So we know that by themselves, chronic pain and depression are highly prevalent. For example, in primary care, the prevalence of depression is 5 to 10 percent and the prevalence of pain is 24 to 37 percent. We also know there is a high incidence of depression in people with pain and vice versa. People with depression are twice as likely to report low back pain than those without depression and 27 percent of people being treated for pain in primary care also have depression. The relationship between pain and depression is likely to be two-way, with each being a trigger for the other. Dr. Sapel reports that chronic pain can negatively affect an individual's ability to engage in meaningful activities and relationships. This can then affect their mental well-being, leading them to develop psychological issues such as depression and anxiety. On the flip side, depression can induce neuroplasticity and changes in neurobiological mechanisms. This can result in hyperalgesia, a lowered pain threshold and increased unpleasantness of pain. Dr. Sapel does talk about this more detail in the module, so I'm just being brief for the podcast's sake. But he ultimately notes the relationship between pain and psychological distress can be a vicious circle in which they feed off and amplify each other. Sangeeta, you look after our pain management content. Do you have any questions about this module? Yeah, I I was really interested to listen to how depression and anxiety and pain are correlated and how there's this sort of vicious circle. So how would you go about managing this situation? This module focuses on the holistic management of both pain and depression, as the management of pain as an individual presentation is covered elsewhere on MIMS Learning, and equally the management of depression as an individual presentation is covered elsewhere. In terms of depression and pain, Dr. Sapel says the first line approach is psychoeducation, so supporting the patient to understand how their pain relates to emotions and behaviours. That's very interesting. Can you talk me through what types of psychoeducation are being talked about here? Well, there's cognitive behavioural therapy. The aim of CBT is to support people to identify, challenge and change unproductive thoughts including memory and mental imagery, feelings, behavioural patterns and somatic experiences. It can also be used to help people understand how these factors interact and maintain the cycle between pain and depression. However, Dr Sapel also discusses acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. ACT has almost the opposite approach to CBT. The aim here is to support people to accept their thoughts and feelings rather than to try to change them. So is that uh, act, is that just mindfulness or is there more to it than that? Well, obviously not clinician, but from what I understand, mindfulness is an important part of ACT, but it's not the only part. In fact, ACT has six core principles, one of which is mindfulness or present moment awareness. And the other five principles are acceptance, cognitive diffusion, self as context, values and committed action. I mean, to be honest, cognitive diffusion was a new one on me, but that apparently means the labelling and observing of internal experiences without being caught up in them. So alongside CBT and ACT, which are more general psychological therapies that you would use for a range of indications, are there therapies specifically for individuals with pain? 
Yes, Dr. Sapel talks about pain management programs. He says these are evidence-based, psychologically informed, multidisciplinary group interventions. He explains they are effective for improving the pain experience, mood and coping abilities. And they also help to reduce negative outlooks on pain and increase activity levels. Depression and pain must be just one way of how mental health affects physical health or the other way around. So I imagine that physical health and mental health interact in several different ways. Absolutely. We actually do have um, a mental health versus physical health learning plan that looks at the relationship. I won't talk about every single module that's in the plan, but the modules include a webinar on well-being and people with COPD by Dr. Azar Salim. He's a GP with a special interest in respiratory. We've got an in-depth review of the use of psychotropic medication in people with renal impairment by pharmacist Michelle Ladd and an ECG interpretation for psychiatrists. In this module, cardiac physiologist Christiana Montiero, and I apologise if I've mispronounced her name, outlines the basics of ECG interpretation and explores how psychotropic medication can potentially affect ECG findings. Well, thanks Dawn for these insights into a difficult challenge for clinicians. You'll be able to find links to the modules mentioned in the podcast player description. And we're going to go now to Sangeeta's interview with Dr. Lowry. So we'll see you on the other side where Dawn and I will join Sangeeta again for a discussion of our learning nugget. Today I'm joined by Dr. Juliet Lowry, who, in addition to being our clinical advisor for gastroenterology, is consultant gastroenterologist at Dorset County Hospital. Hi, Juliet, and welcome to the podcast. Hi. Before we begin, could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Okay, so I'm going to show my age by telling you I qualified in 1992. I've done various jobs over the years in different hospitals. My first consultant post NHS was at Salisbury for, for 14 years. And there I was involved in varying pathologies, including cancer, as well as IBD, as well as difficult reflux. I was an interventional endoscopist. So I was quite heavily involved doing ERCP and stenting. And latterly, in my last job, which I've actually just rejoined the NHS, actually, at Dorchester Hospital, I do mainly clinics, outpatient clinics, and I work with the IBD team there. And I see a fair amount of complex inflammatory bowel disease. And historically, I've been very involved in the MDTs uh, and the biologics type meetings. Thank you. That's really interesting. So speaking of IBD, are we seeing an increase in the prevalence of IBD in the UK? And what do you think are the causes of this increase? And have you seen any changes in the prevalence UK or worldwide over time? Yes. I mean, the answer is yes to both of those questions, sadly. We are definitely seeing an increase in the prevalence of inflammatory bowel disease in our country and also globally. Some of that will reflect increased detection and earlier diagnosis as a result of sophisticated techniques, but there is no doubt that this is becoming a more common disease. And the current estimate is around 7 million patients globally, with an incidence of around 84 per 100,000 of the population. The highest prevalence globally is reported in North America and North Europe. We are now, interestingly, seeing IBD more in countries that previously we hadn't, which are becoming more westernised. So we're even talking about rural areas of, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, India, and it is likely that does relate to westernization and modernization of societies. And, you know, we can talk about reasons for that later. So could you talk a little bit about what IBD is and what the different subtypes are? Yes, so IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, I think the first thing to say is it is an autoimmune disease, which we are seeing increasingly anyway, particularly post-COVID pandemic, so it comes under the umbrella of autoimmune disease. It is also important to say that many people think of it just as a gut disease, and I think it's now clearly demonstrating itself to be a more systemic disease, manifesting with symptoms and signs outside of the gut. And we call that extra intestinal symptoms. 
And interestingly, some of those can predate the gut symptoms. So in terms of classification, IBD is divided into generally three subtypes. So ulcerative colitis, and this is a disease purely of the colon, and it's characterized by ulcers throughout the colon confluent ulceration, which normally always involves the rectum and can progress more proximally up the bowel. Crohn's disease, by contrast, can affect any part of the gut and it can affect, for example, the lips, the oral mucosa, buccal mucosa, the perianal area and the esophagus and the stomach. That's more common in children and the duodenum. And then classically, it commonly affects the end of the small bowel, the terminal ileum and anywhere in the colon or rectum. And there are various classifications for its location in terms of where it's prevalent. The third type is where the pathologist can't completely make up his or her mind when he's looking at biopsies under the microscope, um, whether this is Crohn's disease and whether this is colitis, and each has distinct morphology. We call that IBDU, which means IBD unclassified, and it tends to behave more like Crohn's disease. There is a subtype called microscopic colitis, which actually some don't regard as part of IBD, but I certainly do, and that that presents with watery diarrhoea and the colon looks healthy. When you do a colonoscopy and look with the naked eye, the colon looks healthy, but interestingly, the disease is seen only under the microscope. So biopsies are mandatory for that diagnosis. So are there some symptoms that might be missed by GP or by a clinician? Yeah, I mean, and by patients. That's the thing, particularly. So I would say definitely for Crohn's disease. Absolutely. And I do believe that there are probably many individuals out there who have Crohn's disease but haven't yet been diagnosed and might never be diagnosed because it can be fairly non-specific with remitting, relapsing symptoms in the absence of rectal bleeding. So bleeding hematochesia is not a common symptom of, of Crohn's disease. Some patients might just have bloating as their isolated symptom. And I think Times have changed in terms of the presentation of such patients. Historically, we used to see a Crohn's patient as someone who was underweight, you know, malnourished, fatigued, etc. We are increasingly now seeing Crohn's disease in overweight patients, and there is undoubtedly some association with the metabolic syndrome. So I think it's important for general practitioners to be wary of patients who are recurrently visiting them with ongoing abdominal pain because a tiny percentage of those patients will probably have Crohn's disease. The other thing is, which I think will be a learning point from the podcast, is perianal disease can initially just present with a perianal abscess, and that can happen very quickly and require an emergency admission to hospital, and that's drained very quickly by the surgeon on call, who may often not be an IBD or a colorectal surgeon with an interest in Crohn's or inflammatory bowel disease. And a number of those patients may go on to have significant perianal Crohn's disease, and it's important not to miss that opportunity of diagnosis. And that's one area we need to do better. And in your experience, what is the awareness of IBD among clinicians? So I think it's definitely improved over the years. I think with the stool biomarker fecal calprotectin, which we can talk about a bit later, is it has been very helpful in this regard. You know, it's certainly important to really educate medical students and allied healthcare professionals during their training that IBD is not IBS. And that sounds such a simple statement, but it still surprises me. So IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. It's completely different. There is no organic inflammation when you look at the bowel of people with IBS. It doesn't mean to say that there's nothing wrong, because there is. There's something wrong with the nerve supply to the gut. But IBS is not IBD. And I do think there is still a muddle in some people's heads about that, which I think needs to change. As a non-clinician, I definitely get muddled about with these two things. <laughs> what are the different causes and how preventable or reversible is IBD in, a, in your experience? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, a huge question to answer. And obviously, I can't answer that. And I don't think anyone can answer that comprehensively at the moment in terms of what are the causes of IBD. But certainly in the last 10 years or so, there's been huge amounts of research looking at this and very interesting discoveries and certainly influences from the environment must play a part in triggering inflammatory bowel disease in patients who 
probably already have a genetic tendency to develop this autoimmune condition. So these external influences are called exposomes and they include things like the diet, which is a massive area now. And I think it's an area where research has been sadly lacking and because of the increase in IBD we're seeing now in populations that we haven't previously. Diet has to be a significant factor. And these things include ultra processed foods, which unfortunately we're seeing in every supermarket aisle in great quantity and in petrol stations. And also, latterly, there's quite a lot of interest in emulsifiers, which are fairly prolific in our diets. Mayonnaise is an example. And, and these substances, for example, carboxycellulose, uh, polysorbitol, these are fairly rife in our diet. Other things, so breastfeeding is probably protective against IBD. Antibiotics is another huge area, not only in IBD, but in premature colorectal cancer, which we're sadly seeing more of. So what you're exposed to in your first few years of life, particularly during birth, crossing the birth canal, during the process of birth, being exposed to the maternal microbiome and subsequently what antibiotics you might be given for chest infections or ear infections as a young child can potentially have a knock-on effect on your microbiome and that in itself then affects your mucosal integrity of your gut and how your immune system of the gut actually works. Um, other things, so smoking is definitely associated with Crohn's disease and interestingly it seems to be protective in ulcerative colitis so it's not that uncommon for a new patient with ulcerative colitis to tell us that they've recently quit smoking. We do see that fairly commonly. So there are a huge amount of things. Uh, COVID is, again, I know you're going to ask me about COVID, but COVID is one of many viruses that potentially is a trigger for autoimmune disease generally in patients who have a susceptibility. So certainly viruses are implicated also in this condition. You did ask me about how preventable and reversible it is. I mean, I think, as I alluded to, I think prevention is going to have to focus on the exposomes and it's going to have to focus on diet and diet in early life. I think healthy diets in early life is going to be potentially, in my opinion, a way forward for preventing or reducing the prevalence of this condition. Reversible, well, the mucosal ulceration that we see is, is reversible, absolutely, if treated aggressively and promptly by the right drugs, particularly biologic drugs. So what's the diagnostic pathway for IBD? That obviously varies in different parts of the world and the country. I think the two d diagnostic pathways that are important are getting patients first diagnosed and seen in secondary care. So obviously the GP, the primary to secondary care pathway, which... I think that's where faecal calprotectin, a stool marker, so faecal calprotectin is a, a small calcium-bound protein which is within neutrophils and during any inflammatory episode involving the gut, it's released into the lumen of the gut uh, as a consequence of an inflammatory episode. And that can be detected in someone's stool and that has been a game changer in terms of helping screen out patients with inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, from patients with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And that is generally now available to many general practitioners in primary care. It is important to say that reference ranges have changed over the years since its development. You know, we used to use cutoffs of over 50 micrograms per gram as a means to refer into secondary care. We've relaxed that to 250 now. That seems to be a a more helpful level. From a practical point of view, for people listening who use this test, it's important that it's not done for a young woman or an older woman who's still having periods. The sample should not be processed during the period because it can be contaminated by blood, which can give you a false positive. Certain medications such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aspirin, and proton pump inhibitor drugs can potentially influence the results. So ideally, these drugs should be stopped for a couple of weeks. But it's a very helpful tool in a diagnostic pathway because it has a strong negative predictive value in terms of the rule out of IBD from IBS. I do think, I should say though, it's not perfect like any test and one should not be wholly reliant on this test. The general NICE guidance is that it should be used in patients below the age of 60 where IBD is suspected and is not a replacement for looking for bowel cancer, which is a completely different stool test. So you can get people with Crohn's disease who have a normal calprotectin and who have a normal C-reactive protein. So they are a minority 
but if you are still suspicious, don't see those normal results as completely the panacea of reassurance. One, one needs to still be inquisitive in patients with persistent symptoms. To make the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis is easy. It's just done by a colonoscopy. There is no other way of diagnosing it. Crohn's disease is different because of the nature of the disease and it involves the wall of the bowel, so the mural layers of the small bowel, for example, and the mesentery and um, can cause lymph nodes as a reaction to develop around the bowel. So we can look for Crohn's not just by colonoscopy or ileocolonoscopy, aiming to take biopsies from the end of the small bowel at colonoscopy, where we often see Crohn's in the terminal ileum, so ileitis, Crohn's ileitis. But we can also diagnose Crohn's disease further up in the small bowel by MRI scans. So MR enterography, otherwise known as small bowel MRI or enterocrisis is another name for it, has really revolutionised the way we investigate patients in terms of diagnosing small bowel Crohn's disease. And it's a nice test because it doesn't involve any radiation to young patients. Obviously, it is a bit claustrophobic, but I'm always quite humbled by how many young people, particularly with mental health issues, can tolerate a small bowel MRI for a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Again, it is not completely accurate. A normal small bowel MRI does not rule out small bowel Crohn's completely because you can get subtle mucosal disease with just ulcers, which you won't see on an MRI scan. The MRI scan is there to pick up, you know, changes of mural thickening, the wall, stenosis, fibrosis, strictures that we see with Crohn's. So the other test that one might consider in that regard, if your level of suspicion is high, would be a video capsule endoscopy, which unfortunately many trusts still don't have available on site, which is a shame. It's a non-invasive test. You swap a, a vitamin-sized capsule, which takes photographs of your small bowel, and, and that can pick up mucosal Crohn's disease. Small bowel ultrasound is another tool now, and it's actually routine in parts of Europe. Again, we're sadly lacking in the UK with regard to the availability of small bowel ultrasound, which seems, you know, seems a little bit prehistoric to say that because ultrasound is a commonly used tool but it's about getting the radiologists or other healthcare professionals trained in interpretation with having the right kit and small bowel ultrasound is non-invasive and it's a very good way of particularly monitoring patients with small bowel Crohn's who've already been diagnosed but it can actually help diagnose small bowel Crohn's alongside using other markers and other other tools. How do you think COVID has impacted the IBD and the IBD treatment pathway and just the treatment of IBD? So it has it has many facets, really, to how it has done that. I think the first thing, you know, is always to think about the patients and particularly those patients who were on immunosuppressive immunomodulatory drugs or steroids during the pandemic and initially were advised to shield. And that had a massive impact, obviously, on many, many patients. And interestingly, all the data that's since come out globally suggests that patients on the biologic drugs fared well when they got COVID. And that actually perhaps that, you know, the cytokine storm you get with, we're talking about patients with severe COVID, hospitalised with severe COVID, that they actually didn't do any worse than patients who weren't on anti-TNF type drugs. Steroids were the real concern and, you know, out of all the drugs in inflammatory bowel disease, steroids are still the one major concern to clinicians in terms of long-term health risks. So that was a difficult time during the first phase. In terms of um, are patients with IBD more at risk of COVID, the answer to that is no. So we now know that, so that's good. Does COVID cause a flare in patients who already have IBD? I think the jury is out on that one. I think the trials are ongoing in that area. I have to say anecdotally, a number of our patients seem to have flared when they got COVID. But again, there is no hard evidence for this as yet. Clearly, because of endoscopy units shutting down to just doing urgent cases, when I say urgent, endoscopy went on generally for two-week waits for patients with suspected cancer. But patients waiting for an endoscopy to diagnose their colitis became one of many patients on a long waiting list. So delays, delays in diagnosis for sure with COVID. The vaccine, I think just important to mention that we recommended that all patients had the four vaccines. And that definitely has been shown to be beneficial in terms of outcomes from COVID. And I want to talk about biologics. There's so many of them on the market and so many of them are used for 
IBD. So what what is their role? And do you see this evolving in the future? Yes, in the course of my consultant um, lifetime, I would say they've all sort of suddenly appeared over the last 20 years. And it's interesting. I mean, obviously, you say there are so many of them. There, obviously, to a non-clinician, there are quite a few. But compared to other specialties like dermatology and rheumatology, we don't actually have a huge number that are actually approved and readily available. But there are lots on the way, and also not just biologics, the small molecule drugs, which are now gaining favour. So I think the first thing to say about these biologic drugs is they have certainly changed our mindset as to how we treat patients with what we call refractory or more severe inflammatory bowel disease. And interestingly, the more traditional and older fashioned type drugs such as azathioprine which, or thiopurines, which is called an immunomodulatory drug, have lost favour in COVID for various reasons, which I won't go into. And I think in some ways, I think that's going to change again. We're going to be using it a bit more again. But biologic drugs are generally reserved for a minority of patients, but that minority is now increasing. So a few years ago, I used to say that one in 10 of our patients might need a biologic. I have to say, I think it's nearer two in 10, so 20% now are needing biologic therapy. And particularly those patients with what we call an aggressive presentation of their disease. So for example, someone coming into hospital with acute severe ulcerative colitis at presentation, nearly all of those patients will get biologic exposure in the hope to avoid an early colectomy, a significant operation to remove their bowel. And biologics are now readily available for treating patients with moderate to moderately severe Crohn's disease, particularly where aggressive presentations, including what we call fibrotic or stenosing diseases. But the important point to make here is that treating patients aggressively and early is the way to go. So what we call the top-down approach, rather than waiting for recurrent episodes of Crohn's to actually result in fibrosis and then a stricture, we want to avoid that ever happening. So the biologics are changing the natural history of inflammatory bowel disease, and particularly in children, that's a very important point. And so the vital thing is to use them early. There are newer drugs all the time coming out, as you alluded to. The small molecules, they're called the JAK kinase inhibitors, so tofacitinib, upadacitinib. These drugs are also now becoming more popular. And in fact, upadacitinib has just got a license to use in difficult Crohn's disease. So I think these are going to be drugs that we're probably going to end up seeing about a third of our patients on in the long term. But I think it's very important not to forget the older fashioned ones which are the right choice and also not to forget surgery. Surgery should not be seen as a failure of of therapy by gastroenterologists, particularly in Crohn's disease and also doing a colectomy relatively early on in someone with ulcerative colitis which is a lifelong condition in terms of cancerous prevention is not necessarily a bad decision. Okay and what sort of outcomes can we expect for patients with IBD? they're positive and I think generally it's just a case in point with regard to social media because as you know social media is very prevalent now particularly in in the younger population where we see often a peak of diagnosis of IBD you know IBD we often see diagnosed in people in the early 20s up to the age of 40 and then there tends to be a bimodal distribution and a peak later in, in life But the young people with Crohn's, generally, I think the outcomes we want to see, they need to be positive and not negative. And it does make me sad when I sometimes see negative outcomes advertised on social media with regard to Crohn's disease. Because this is a disease, again, if we catch it early and we treat it aggressively, for many, the outcomes are good. Perianal disease is challenging. And I think that's an area a bit like diet as a potential driver for IBD. Perianal disease is where research has been lacking but is improving because that is something that nearly one in five patients with Crohn's disease will experience at some stage, perianal disease. And there are newer surgical techniques coming out to help with complex perianal disease. So I think that is challenging and the outcomes of perianal disease are not optimal at the moment. I think having a stoma, the stigma around that, is you know that there is actually improving. So I think the destigmatization of having an ileostomy or a colostomy is happening, and I think that's a positive thing that we are seeing through social media. It's important to say that if we can halt the inflammation early and prevent changes in the cells to dysplasia, and dysplasia is on the 
journey towards cancer and we know that patients with IBD have a twofold risk of getting cancer compared to the general population, we know that we can therefore hopefully reduce colorectal cancer incidence in inflammatory bowel disease. Are there any key learning points that you would like to pass on to other clinicians? The one thing to say is to have a level of suspicion. Um, remember that IBD is not just a disease of the gut, so, and I didn't talk about that too much, but these extra intestinal symptoms involve joint pain, back pain, eye conditions, so uveitis, episcleritis, iritis, oral ulceration in the mouth can be a manifestation of, of Crohn's disease. Skin lesions, and there are all sorts of skin lesions associated with inflammatory bowel disease, and liver conditions, primary sclerosis and cholangitis. So I think it's to be alert to extra intestinal symptoms, um, uh, both in primary and secondary care. I think it's important, as I said earlier, to not be totally reassured by the CRP and faecal calprotectin in someone who's presenting again and again in primary care because there is a chance they may have Crohn's colitis and that you don't have to be underweight to diagnose that. You can be overweight to have Crohn's disease. And I think the main learning point that I think is really important is the perianal abscess and the perianal disease. It's not, you know, it's when you get a discharge summary as a GP of a young man or young woman that's been admitted over a weekend, you know, that you actually recall, and I know this is challenging now, but if you recall that patient to your surgery or telephone them, just to talk about how they're doing and if they've got any other symptoms because it is so important to get that disease early to prevent complications. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you, do you have a person who has inspired you in your life? My father actually was a gastroenterologist, so I guess that had an effect on me. I think the people that inspire me the most, though, without sounding a bit, you know, a bit seedy about it, are the patients, particularly the very young adolescent or university students who have gone through colectomies with a stoma or nasty perianal disease, they are incredibly humbling in terms of how well they cope with it. Um, and I think that the psychological support around that has improved with the existence of inflammatory bowel disease nurses available now in most trusts. I do remember one young woman, she was a triplet. Interestingly, despite the possible genetic link, she had two triplet sisters, neither of whom had inflammatory bowel disease. And she was very unlucky. She had a severe reaction to a very basic drug, a 5-ASA drug, amino salicylate drug, mesalazine, and got acute pancreatitis, requiring hospitalisation for that. She recovered well from that, and she then went on a biologic on infliximab. Unfortunately, she developed a severe infusion reaction to that after a, a few months. It was working well, and then it wasn't working so well. This was fairly early on with biologic treatments being available. She then went for a colectomy to remove her colon in the hope to cure her ulcerative colitis. And unfortunately, she went into liver failure following her colectomy. And to this day, it wasn't certain what caused it, whether it was an antibiotic at induction that was given or whether it was the anaesthetic agent, but she almost went for a transplant, but thank goodness she avoided that and she got better. And she now lives with her stoma and she is one of my memorable, yeah, quite humbling patients. Yeah, so this drives me on to treat patients earlier with the optimal evidence-based therapies in order to achieve the best possible outcomes. Thank you, Julia. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Hello, I'm back with Dawn and Sangeeta to discuss this episode's learning nugget. So over to you, Dawn. All right, yeah. So I want to discuss a potential new drug for treatment-resistant hypertension. So that is hypertension that is not controlled despite optimal medical therapy. So three or more drugs. In her February 2023 cardiology research briefing, Dr. Shazia Hussein discusses a study by Freeman et al. on the selective aldosterone inhibitor Baxterostat. Aldosterone, of course, helps regulate blood pressure. In very simplistic terms, it helps increase blood pressure when you need it to be increased, so when you're standing up, etc. However, in a person with hypertension, aldosterone levels may be too high, meaning that blood pressure is too high. So by inhibiting aldosterone, you could potentially reduce blood pressure. A caveat, according to the study authors, 
is that historically selective inhibition of aldosterone has been difficult to achieve. They comment cortisol synthesis is catalyzed by another enzyme that shares 93% sequence similarity with aldosterone synthase, which in my laywoman's understanding means you're going to be inhibiting cortisol when you don't want to be. Baxterostat though has a 100 to 1 selectivity for enzyme inhibition and preliminary studies suggest that it reduces plasma aldosterone levels without reducing cortisol levels. Based on the Freeman et al. study, it is effective. Patients with treatment-resistant hypertension who received the drug had dose-related reductions in blood pressure compared with those who were receiving placebo. Dr. Hussein calls these findings exciting because they highlight a potential new therapy for the substantial proportion of people with treatment-resistant hypertension. All that sounds really exciting on the surface, but how far away is the actual use of this agent in the UK? And how reproducible are these results? Well, I mean, it, it, it's early stages, so it's not approved anywhere as far as I know. As for duplicating these results, a second study by Dr. Deepak Bat and colleagues did not find a significant difference between Baxterostat and placebo. And this second study actually was published very soon after the first study of note. Dr. Bat told a medical news website that the lack of difference between Baxterostat and placebo that they observed in their study may be because patients were more adherent to their background therapy than they normally were. He added that somewhat paradoxically, there were also indications that people in the Baxterostat group weren't taking the new agent. Thus, the reductions in blood pressure seen in the study were possibly because of the medications they'd already been prescribed prior to the study. These findings do raise the challenging issue of adherence. When is it treatment-resistant hypertension? And when is it patients not taking them pills hypertension? Because, of course, no medication will work if it stays in the packet. Absolutely. And it's very interesting to hear this about treatment-resistant hypertension, which must be a, a real puzzle for clinicians. Most clinicians must be well aware of the issue of adherence. And we have a guidance module about medicines optimization, following on from... NICE guidelines issued in 2015, which are still current. This reveals that apparently between a third and a half of prescribed medicines are not taken as intended. This is a figure that I find quite staggering. But with hypertension, perhaps it's even worse because antihypertensives are taken to prevent future adverse events rather than treat a condition. So presumably adherence is that much more difficult. Yes, possibly. In its guidelines on hypertension, in the section where it's talking about treatment-resistant hypertension, NICE acknowledge that adherence may be the issue rather than the patient not responding to treatment. Therefore, it recommends prior to doing anything else, like adding in another drug or referring them to a specialist, that the doctor or the healthcare professional sits with the patient and have a discussion about adherence. I mean, basically, a good, honest discussion is always going to be key. Understanding why a patient might be struggling to adhere to a medicine regimen is important. I mean, they may need advice on how to take it correctly, or they just may need support to how to fit that medical regimen into their lifestyle. Yes, that's true. And there are definitely parallels in other clinical areas. In asthma care, for example, adherence to use of steroid inhalers may not be optimal, and patients may not even know how to use their inhaler correctly. Yeah, I mean, addressing adherence is vital in cases where the treatment doesn't appear to be working, whether that's asthma or hypertension. But adherence is not going to be the only issue. Sometimes a patient is adherent and the treatment simply isn't working. In hypertension, at least, that is when nice say to ask for specialist advice or look at new options such as adding in a new drug. Further data for Baxterostat or any other treatment focused on treatment resistant hypertension is awaited. Well, thank you very much, Dawn and Sangeeta, for a stimulating discussion. In a fortnight, we'll be back with more key learning points drawn from our clinical learning modules. In the meantime, do follow the links below the podcast to read more about the topics that we've discussed. And we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>